This Week at NASA. A changing of the guard on board the International Space Station as Expedition 31 Commander Oleg Koroniko handed over the reins of the orbiting outpost to cosmonaut Gennady Padalka during a change of command ceremony. The start of Padalka's tenure as the lead of Expedition 32 makes him the first three-time commander of the station. He's joined on the crew by NASA flight engineer Joe Akaba and Russian flight engineer Sergei Revin. Two days later, Kononenko and flight engineers Don Pettit of NASA and Andre Kuipers of the European Space Agency climbed into their Soyuz spacecraft and departed the station for the trip back to Earth. Touchdown. The Expedition 31 crew, Oleg Kononenko, Don Pettit, Andre Kuipers, home after 193 days in space. The trio made a successful parachute-assisted landing on the steppe of Kazakhstan to cap off a six-month stay on board the ISS. Senator Barbara Mikulski, chairwoman of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science and Related Agencies, visited NASA's Wallops Flight Facility recently. Joined by officials from NASA, Orbital Sciences Corporation and others, the senator was updated on the status of Orbital Sciences Corporation's Antares rocket and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport's new pad from which the vehicle will launch. Antares is slated to carry Orbital's Cygnus pressurized cargo module on a demonstration flight under NASA's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services program in December 2012 and begin carrying supplies to the International Space Station in 2013. The first steps in preparing for NASA's Exploration Flight Test 1, or EFT-1, in 2014 are underway at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. As the Orion team completes its welding of the crew module, the spacecraft will next move to the Kennedy Space Center's Operation and Checkout Facility, where its processing will continue through final assembly and testing. We've been here probably working on this for the last six or eight months, and uh, they've spent a lot of weekends and nights trying to get us to uh, this point on the program. Engineers at Marshall Space Flight Center tested a composite crew module in the Environmental Test Facility vacuum chamber to gauge how a space structure fabricated with composite materials will react in a simulated space environment. During the test, the crew module was pressurized and filled with helium to allow engineers to inspect it for leaks. Once we understand what that leak rate is, we can then start to pursue understanding what's contributing to that leak rate, whether it's the uh, the fittings that are bolted through the surface or through the thickness of the crew module or whether it's coming through the skin. The crew module was designed to test new materials and fabrication techniques that might be used to construct future space structures from both metals and composites. The composite crew module project is led by NASA's Engineering and Safety Center at Langley Research Center. Expedition 31 flight engineer Don Pettit is nothing if not A, passionate about conducting science research in space, and B, in possession of a healthy sense of humor. Combine the two and you have Diary of a Space Zucchini, Pettit's space blog authored from the point of view of a squash growing from seed aboard the International Space Station. While the chronicles of the space zucchini may constitute an entertaining and educational novelty, see the June 9th entry, Great News I Have a Baby Brother Sprout, important plant studies have long been conducted in space. Vegetation investigations on the ISS have had real scientific goals for Earth and space exploration benefits. From improved crop production on the ground to one day providing fresh produce on orbit, Sprouts in Space provide a bumper crop of data for research. You can now use the internet and a smartphone for an inside look at the groundbreaking science and technology research being done on board the International Space Station. Log on to the agency's Space Station Live webpage or download the companion ISS Live mobile app to get up-to-the-minute information on experiments NASA astronauts are conducting 240 miles in space for the benefit of all on Earth. You can also take a virtual tour of the station and get a peek at the operator consoles inside ISS Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center. <laughs>
NASA's Ames Research Center hosted about 30 elementary school students for a one-week learning experience as part of the Green Scholars Program. The program is focused on developing and highlighting the academic skills of African American students with the goal of inspiring them to pursue higher education. It's very fun. I get to learn more about science and I really like science, so I think this has been a very good experience. Ames Deputy Director Lou Braxton met with the students to give them advice and encouragement. During the week, the scholars participated in various math and science projects, and at the end of the week, each student received a graduation certificate to mark their achievement. Preparations for the launch of NASA's Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, or LADEE, are in full gear at the Wallops Flight Facility. Erected on the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport's Pad Zero B, a mock-up of the vehicle allowed technicians to check out how the spacecraft will fit with its Air Force Minotaur V rocket and launcher. Additional fit and procedural checks were conducted at other Wallops facilities that will be used to process the vehicle. LADEE is scheduled to be launched from Wallops in mid-2013. Speaking before an enthusiastic crowd at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, NASA Administrator Charles Bolden delivered this year's John H. Glenn Lecture in Space History. Bolden reflected on his career as a marine aviator, a space shuttle pilot and commander, and his tenure as the leader of the nation's space agency. It's been my honor to be a part of our nation's greatest successes and to help shepherd NASA to its next destinations. There are many bright days ahead for the nation's space program and for civilization's progress into space. I hope every one of you, though, is as excited and passionate as I am about ensuring that we realize every potential of our times. Bolden was also presented the Excellence in Public Service Award by former Senator and astronaut John Glenn on behalf of the John Glenn School of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University. The award honors a person who demonstrates outstanding dedication to public service. The award ceremony was held at the Koshland Science Museum of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. Sir, how you doing? It's hard. How are you doing? And Bolden and Glenn were joined by another former Marine to take in some art at Air and Space. The museum's director, General Jack Daly, led the tour of the exhibit gallery featuring Fly Marines, the Centennial of Marine Corps Aviation, 1912 to 2012. That's a good picture, that's a good shot of course. The 91 works of art were selected from the more than 8,000 pieces in the Marine Corps Art Program collection. NASA teamed up with Vanderbilt University's Dyer Observatory in Brentwood, Tennessee to host a Summer of Innovation event for rising fifth and sixth graders from the Nashville area. The students enjoyed hands-on Mars-related activities and got to speak with NASA Associate Administrator for Education and former astronaut Leland Melvin. The young attendees were also treated to an evening concert and stage presentation. Summer of Innovation aims to inspire and engage middle school students in science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM fields. This is the second year Dyer Observatory has partnered with NASA for Summer of Innovation. Station, this is Tori Hunter. How do you hear me? Tori, this is Joe Acaba aboard the International Space Station. I hear you loud and clear. Aboard the International Space Station, Expedition 31 flight engineer Joe Acaba, a lifelong fan of the Los Angeles Angels, recently chatted with Angels outfielder Tori Hunter, who was on the field at Angel Stadium in Anaheim, California, preparing for the team's game that night. I always encourage kids to go out and take away fear, worry, and doubt, and don't listen to anybody that's negative and tell you that you can't do anything. You can be an astronaut, you can be a Major League Baseball player, anything you want to be, just put your mind to it and your heart into it. Hey, Amen, I agree with you 100%, and you know, I think you and I are, are pretty good examples of people that, you know, dreams can come true, and we're living that right now. The conversation between Akaba and Hunter was replayed for the fans in Anaheim before the June 22nd game with the LA Dodgers, and was also aired on the Angels television network. 15 years ago, on July 4, 1997, the Mars Pathfinder landed on the Red Planet seven months after it was launched. 
Pathfinder landed on Mars's Ares Vallis in a region called Chrysi Planitia in the Oxia Pallas Quadrangle. The mission carried a series of scientific instruments to analyze the Martian surface, climate, geology, and the composition of its rocks and soil. It was the second project from NASA's Discovery Program. Pathfinder consisted of a lander renamed the Carl Sagan Memorial Station and a lightweight robotic rover named Sojourner. In addition to scientific objectives, the mission was also proof of concept for various technologies such as the airbag-mediated touchdown and automated obstacle avoidance, both later used by the Mars Exploration Rovers. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories or to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, log on to www.nasa.gov.